ask you to take that away. Y'all ready for the word of God? Amen. I know y'all like, well, who's ministering? Amen. Who's it on? Amen. Amen. He's ministered here before, and I've seen him grow in the Lord. Um, he's my assistant in the ministry. So let's give the Lord some praise for our brother Elliot Cook as he comes and ministers the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, Lighthouse Freedom Center. Amen. You guys can be seated. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. It's a time for celebration. Amen. I know it's already started off awesome. So let's open up in prayer this morning and let's get started. Amen. So Lord God, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for your awesome work at this ministry in all of our lives. And we thank you for this season that the graduates made it through, Lord God. We thank you that you're raising them up, Lord God, and that they seek you first. And that you promise to add everything to them, Lord God. So I thank you for this word this morning, Lord God. I pray that it would speak to people, Lord, and bring remembrance to your awesome power in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so if you would, let's go to Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11 to 16. We got five graduates this morning, so we won't be here long, but we're going to get straight to the point. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 to 16. It says, Make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping His commandments. His rules and regulations that I command you today. Make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, build pleasant houses and settle in. See your herds and flocks flourish and more and more money come in. Watch your standard of living going up and up. Make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God. Your God who delivered you from Egyptian slavery. Does anybody know what that verse is talking about? Has anybody in this house been rescued, delivered, set free, and pulled up out of the miry clay? Amen? I couldn't even hear you, though. Did any, anybody ever been set free by God in this house? I could testify to that, too. So let me ask you a quick multiple-choice question this morning. A, are you that good? B, maybe you're lucky. Maybe you had enough, this is C, maybe you had enough money to buy your way out of trouble. Or D, maybe you were smart enough to fix yourself all by yourself. None of those? Okay, E, how about none of the above? That's right. He pulled you out of the miry clay. It's him. And this is the time to celebrate this morning, but I want to remind you who we're celebrating this morning. You guys are great. But you're not the great I am. The great I am is not you. It's him. We got to remember that. So this morning, I want everybody to realize that our generation is becoming more and more consumed with themselves. And our pride begins to make God hide behind what we think we're doing best. You got all kinds of forms of pride. Maybe some people can relate to this. I know I can relate to a few of these at some times in my life. You got the complaining type of pride. That's the, that's the type of pride that's against and passing judgment on God. In a difficult situation, they say, look at how God, how could God do this to me? I've been so good to him. That type of pride. Or there's also the angry pride. He gets angry often when his rights or his, or his uh, requirements aren't met. Or you got the inflated, the superior pride. They think they're so much better than everybody else. They're a legend in their own mind. They're easily disgusted with others, and they have little tolerance for people and their shortcomings. They always find the faults in everybody else. And then you got the pride that will never admit they're wrong. The two most powerful words in the war world, I'm sorry. That's the hardest thing for them to say. Then you also got the defensive type of pride. This proud person says, are you saying it's my fault? Are you saying it's me? Look at your neighbor and tell him, no, it's you. That's pride telling them that. Or you got this type of pride, that as I'm talking about this, you're wishing somebody was here that you know that could hear this. 
That type of pride. Pride, it comes in so many different dangerous forms. But you know what the outcome to all of them is? Let's turn to Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride in all its various dangerous forms, hidden, subtle. Sometimes you're never going to find out what it is until it's too late. All comes to this one thing. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride comes before the fall. Pride comes before the fall. It always ends in self-destruction. You, know you know what I noticed about pride in the Bible? God never commands or suggests us that we should begin to think highly of ourselves, that we should ever lift ourselves up and, and look at ourselves as so great. He doesn't have to tell us that. You know why? Because we do that ourselves. We're perfect at lifting ourselves up and leaving God on the back burner and forgetting all about him. Listen to this quote. Those that think too much of themselves, they don't think enough. Those that, those that think too much of themselves don't think enough. Naturally, we begin to concentrate more on ourselves, especially when things are going good. This is for, really for the graduates and everybody in the faith home. Think about this. Think about every time somebody stumbled and fell and they come back crying to God. It's always when they were doing good. You know why that probably is? Because every time we're doing good, we tend to forget about God. We put God on the back burner, and then we begin to listen to pride. Pride starts telling you, look how awesome you are. Pride starts telling you, look how all the good stuff you've got. Look at all the fancy cars you got. Look at your wall in your office. Look at all the degrees, all the plaques that you got. Look at your tax bracket. Look how good you're doing. All of a sudden, all you hear is you. And the more that you listen to you, the more, and I mean, excuse me, the more you listen to you, the less you think about him. So let's go real quick to Proverbs 26, 12. And I know when you get way up in there and you become so spiritual and every becomes, everything comes so great in your life, you begin to look at yourself. And God wants you to know that you're great, but he wants you to know that he's the one that got you there. And you've got to remember that. So Proverbs 26, 12. Proverbs 26, 12. It says, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? Do you see a man taking credit for everything he's got? Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. I don't want God calling me no fool, right? But let's look in the dictionary real quick what fool stands for. So in the Webster Dictionary, fool says, one who is destitute of reason or the common powers of understanding, an idiot. Some persons are born fools and some are natural fools. Others may become fools by some injury done to the brain. The second one. In common language, a person who is somewhat deficient in intellect, but not an idiot, or a person who acts absurdly, one who does not exercise his reason, one who pursu pursues a course contrary to the dictates of wisdom. Now, I know you probably had 10 people came to your mind when I read that, but we've got to be nice this morning. And that's not why I'm bringing up that definition. I'm showing you that's what the world calls a fool. That's what the world views as a fool. But I want everybody to know that God sees a fool completely different. In Scripture, fool is used to describe a wicked or depraved person, one who acts contrary to sound wisdom in his moral behavior, one who follows his own inclinations. Don't lean on your own understanding. How about this part? In the Bible, it refers to fool as one who prefers unimportant and temporary pleasures to the service of God and eternal happiness. So let me get an example of a fool in the Bible. Everybody turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. I know I've been called a fool plenty of times. I know I've been a fool plenty of times. But even now, the world might still call me a fool. But God doesn't see me that way, and I'm about to show you what he views as a fool. So be encouraged. Be encouraged in this beginning season of your life. Be encouraged in his small steps, and don't despise these small beginnings because God's about to raise you up as long as you don't concentrate on all the stuff he's going to give you along with it. So, excuse me, I said 13 through 20, I meant 16 through 21. So in verse 16, talking about the parable of the rich man. Then he told them a parable. This is Jesus saying, there was a rich man whose land was fertile and productive. I'm reading it at the Amplified. Productive, that word stands out. 
And he began thinking to himself, what shall I do since I have no place large enough in which to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my storehouses and build larger ones. And I will store my grain and my goods here. And I will say to my soul, so you have many good things stored up, enough for many years. Re rest and relax. Eat and drink and be merry. Celebrate continually. You are so awesome. I added that part. God said to him, you fool. God called this man a fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now you will own all the and now who will own all the things that you have prepared? Listen to verse 21. So it is for the one who continues to store up and hoard possessions for himself and is not rich in his relationship towards God. I want you to notice in that parable in the King James Version, there's 81 words in that parable. This is such a cool fact. 81 words in that parable. 15 of them are self-related with I, myself, or he. That's one out of every five of those words in that parable are about him. God blessed him with all that stuff, made him productive, made his land fertile, all them awesome crops where he could eat and relax and be merry for the rest of his life, and all he talked about was himself. He raised you up through the whole 18 months of the year of the program, raised you up, showed you all the favor in his life, brought you up, and going to continue to raise you up. So don't forget who did it for you. When it's all about you, you got to be careful because that's my all you get is you. So let's get a little practical. We think about stars and all these famous people in the world. What are some successful fools that everybody looks up to, that everybody tries to be about, that everybody cherishes and searches after and wants to get their autograph and wants to be just like them? Let me give you some examples of, a, of some very successful, very productive fools. I didn't call him a fool. The Bible called him a fool. Listen to this guy. You might not know him, but I'm going to explain something to you. I learned this myself in his studies. A guy named Andrew Carnegie. He's an American industrialist and businessman who established Carnegie Steel Company, later to become the U.S. Steel Company. He actually gave the majority of his wealth to the education system, but he's also a famous atheist. One of his sayings in a book he wrote was, not only have I got rid of theology on the, and all the supernatural stuff, but I found out the truth, and that's evolution. I want you guys to realize that guy right there gave the majority of his stuff to charity, but he's an atheist. How about another one? Uh, I got a few of them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten this. This guy named Stephen Hawking. Anybody ever heard of Stephen Hawking? He's a legal genius, probably the most a famous mathematician that we know, especially in our time. The famous astrophysicist known as the ex an extensive research in cosmology and mathematics. He proposed this theory called the no-boundary theory in one of his books, and here's what his stating about that was. If there is a no-boundary proposal, and it's correct, then God had no freedom at all to choose the universe's initial conditions. He's a known atheist also, but very famous, very successful, very wealthy, very influential. How about this guy? You ever heard of Bruce Lee? American-born Chinese martial artist, physical fitness expert, and a trainer, Big contributor to a bunch of charities, a known atheist. How about Mick Jagger? Anybody ever heard of Mick Jagger? Anybody ever heard of the Rolling Stones? Famous lead singer of the Rolling Stones. Right now he's worth $400 million. He's a known womanizer. He has all kinds, he's like nine different kids from ten different women. Oh, I mean, that's impossible, but you know. <laughs> but he's a known atheist also. Two more. A guy named Steve Wozniak. Computer engineer who founded the Apple computer with Steve Jobs. Their first computer was accidentally sold for $666.66. This is real. I'm not making this up. He's now developed a bunch of wireless GPS systems. And listen to the arrogance of this guy right here. He said, I'm also an atheist or an agnostic. He says, I don't know the difference. I've never been to church but I prefer to think by myself. How about Mark Zuckerberg? Anybody ever heard of that? Anybody Facebook live right now? I'm probably going to have to cut this next one out. But He created Facebook. He's worth over $50 billion. He's a known atheist. 
So I just share that with you to go back to that parable about the rich man that hoarded up all his treasures. Hoarded up and probably gave a lot maybe to his family, but really, why did he do that? There's a term called philanthropy, and all these people here are philanthropists. What, a, what philanthropy is, is it's the desire to promote the welfare of others, expressed especially by the generous donations of money and good causes. Others, but not Jesus. There's nowhere in there where it says Jesus. And you got to look inside your motives for what you're accumulating and getting all your stuff for. Even what you're giving all your stuff away for. Pride will begin to trick you and make you think you're doing a nice thing, but really you're doing it all for you. You're really doing it all for the great I. So these, all these guys I just mentioned, they're extremely productive, correct? They make big, awesome, positive contributions to our society. They help millions of people with all their vast accumulations of wealth, correct? But why are they doing that? They're not doing it to promote Jesus. They're atheists. They're not trying to do it for God, so why are they doing it? They're doing it for, I don't know, maybe to get in a better tax bracket, get a better, better tax fund. Maybe so more people will want their autographs. Maybe so they have more power because probably that's really what it is. But all that power and all that wealth and all that good stuff that they got, all them gifts that made them who they are, they didn't do it themselves. They didn't go to school for it. They didn't get it from some book. They got it initially from God. And when you get raised up, you can't forget him. You can't put him on the back burner. Even when you do become so great that when you look in the mirror, you're probably going to want to only see yourself. you got to remember who made that mirror and made that person look right back, looking right back at you. God calls anyone who puts themselves first a fool. Look at your neighbor and tell him, Mama ain't raised no fool. No, she didn't. So you got to ask yourself, are these people going to hell? Are all these men I just described, are they going to hell? I don't know if they are or not because what about the guy who was on the cross next to Jesus? On his very last breath, he made it to heaven. But I do know this. While they were down here, they did a terrible job of sharing what got them where they're at. They did a terrible job of promoting Jesus and lifting him up in his right place. They did a bad job at that. So were they really successful? Can you really call them a success? Because God calls them a fool. But do you know what's so cool about what the world calls fools? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27. And I'm almost done. This is my verse right here. This is my anthem right here. When you come to the faith home, you need to get this. You need to get this thing deep within you. And never forget it. Put it on the forefront of the tablets of your heart like everybody says. You need to remember this verse right here. Especially when your past comes back and try to whisper and tell you all kinds of crazy stuff. And maybe your friends, your old friends you thought were friends, they come and try to pull you back in there. You need to remember this verse right here. 1 Corinthians verse 1 and 27. And in the King James it says, but God has, given, has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things in the world to confound the, the things which are mighty. But i got to read this thing in a message for you. In the message, just listen. You can close your eyes and just listen to this. This is for you. This is for everybody here in the faith and everybody that thinks that they're not good or, that, or listens to what the voice of the enemy is trying to tell them. This is for you. Take a good look, friends. And who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential. Not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That makes it quite clear that none of us, none of you, can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, great things, awesome cars, fancy stuff, nice clothes, everything you're going to get because God promises it to you. All that, a clean slate and a fresh start, it comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. That's why they have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, you better blow a trumpet for God. Amen? So, this morning... Today and tomorrow, don't forget why you're here. Don't forget who got you through it all and got you this far. Don't let the subtle voice of pride come tell you how good you are and it was, it was all you. It was him. 
Because I got news. You're great, but the great I am is not you. It's him. It's always been him. It always will be him. And if you keep him forefront, he'll continue to make you greater and greater and greater. So listen, this morning, if you've been living your own life, if you've been doing your own thing, if you've forgotten God and what he's done for you and how far he's brought you from, if that's you, I promise you he hasn't forgotten about you. I promise you he's waiting for you to just turn back. Admit that you're a human being and your pride rised up, and that's fine. But come back to him because he's waiting for you. Turn back to him and he'll promise and he'll be faithful to be there with open arms waiting for you and blesses you for your humility coming back to him. Amen? Congratulations, Faith Home. You guys are awesome. Hallelujah. What a powerful word. I'm going to have them come back and finish that one. Amen.